from the Lagos State Public Service. Uh, this program actually came to fore as part of the strategies being deployed by the Ministry of Establishment, Training and Pensions to actually keep business going in the face of adversity. So we have obviously invited some people who will be taking us through the resilient workforce. I want to just save sufficient time for us by saying that um, the opening remarks is just to say thank you very much to everybody who have joined, who has joined, and also to enjoin you to take the best of opportunities of a number of these programs that we will be rolling out in the course of this lockdown. It's just a reflection of the fact that the Ministry of Establishment, Training and Pensions is not actually closing shop, even in the face of this challenging um, COVID-19. On this note, I will want to quickly invite the director training in the ministry to introduce our uh, panelists, and then we take it from there. Thank you very much. And once again, you are welcome. Good morning. Good morning, um, Honorable Commissioner. Um, good morning, my PS and um, Mrs. Moderator and the co-leaders. Um, this morning, we have a very, very um, interesting set of um, leaders um, uh, in our midst. Um, we have Mrs. Akisoya, she's the moderator um, for, for this. And um, Mrs. Akisoya, we have Mrs. Fabangu, who is our chairman, Civil Service Commission. And we also have Mr. Joseph Olofin Shola. He's a partner with the Deloitte. Um, I'd like to just do a brief introduction of um, the people speaking this morning. So we, most of us know them, but um, CA, as she's fondly called, um, she, she's within her professional circle. She loves HR. Um, she's a dynamic result oriented um, and internationally experienced senior HR professional and management consultant with over 12 years in banking and 27 years experience in HR consulting. Oh, I could go on and on about her, but uh, so that it will be brief and I won't bore everybody because we have very interesting things to do. I'll just say, well, this is her forte. She loves what she's doing and she's looking forward to be our moderator for today. So the next person I'd love to introduce is Mrs. Faban, well, she will be on very soon. Um, she's our um, Civil Service Commission Chairman. We all know her. She's a seasoned human resource practitioner a management consultant, uh, passionate about facilitating. You would know that in the course of what's going to happen today. And um, she was once the DG of PSSDC, as we all know. Uh, Mrs. Faban Wo led the PSSDC um, team from 2009, uh, 2009, sorry, 2003 to 2007. Ms. Faban Wo, um, she led her team into reinventing, articulating, and implementing strategic direction, um, which we can see uh, in PSSDC. PSSDC has changed over the years, and that's all through um, what Mrs. Fabango has done. We look forward to her sharing um, her stories and talking to us about resilience in the workforce today. Um, the next person, not the least, is Mr. Lofi Shola. Um, I met him once, um, very intelligent. Um, we know him. Well, I don't think they call him prof, but I will call him prof because he's so intelligent. You know, talking to him, you'd always gather some experience and, and some knowledge. He's a partner with Deloitte Consulting, um, um, consulting West Africa and Central Africa with a wealth of experience in human capital space across various industries. If I go on and on about what he's able to do, then we won't finish. But he's, um, he's functional within his sphere of, um, of influence. And um, he has expertise within the human capital area across organization development, transformation, um, human resource transformation, talent management. He's an advocate of business-driven and high-impact HR industry, which is 
the evidence, which is evident in what he's going to present to us today. So um, I must say at this note, so that it won't be too long, I would have time to answer questions. Um, welcome, Mrs. Moderator, Mrs. Akisoya. Welcome, Mrs. Fabanwo. And thank you, Mr. Lofisha. We look forward to having a wonderful, wonderful discussion today. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Akisoya, over to you, ma'am. Well, thank you very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. It is a delight to be here with all of you. I see the increasing number of participants that are logging on to this uh, call. Let me start by saying a big thank you to the Honorable Commissioner for Establishment, Training and Pension uh, for you and your entire team for being able to put this series together. Indeed, let me start by saying to all participants, for us to have been able to dial onto this call, it simply means we're staying safe, we're well, and we're healthy. So I want to thank God for that. But at the same time, uh, I would like to enjoin all of you to know that we are in a walking mode. This is not by any means a vacation for any one of us. So we are still working. We're still working and we're still learning. So putting this series together is a way of adding to that knowledge to shore us up or to encourage us to take learning to another level. And so it is with delight that we've brought our presenters, our facilitators uh, to you this morning. So for all participants, I would like to say, please listen attentively. Notice I'm saying listen attentively rather than saying listen carefully. Uh, those two things do not mean the same. I'd like you to listen attentively. If possible, take notes. This is a learning session. And uh, the reason also is because we'd like you to ask questions. And if you take note, uh, if you look at the bottom of your screen, depending on whether you're using your laptop or a smart telephone device, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A box. So at any point in time during the presentation, please uh, put in your question at the, in the Q&A box. At the end of the two presentations, we will take our questions and answer series jointly. Please note, at the end of the two presenters, we will take our Q&A sessions jointly. Each of our presenters or facilitators have 20 minutes to present. And I promise you, it will be not only an interactive and educative one, it is one that will add to our body of knowledge even during this COVID-19 period as we all learn the new dynamics of what it means to work from home. With that said, I'd like to call on our first presenter who has been aptly introduced. And I think, Lolade, I will join you. I think now he has a new name. I will call him Prof from now on. So I'd like to... Uh, call uh, our first presenter, uh, Joseph Olofisola, to Olofisola, <laughs> to roll on in his presentation. And uh, stay tuned, everyone, and post your questions as we go on. Twenty minutes to you, uh, Jo. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning once again, everyone. Uh, for the Commissioner, uh, the PANSEC, and other members of the Lagos State Public at Service. It is my pleasure this morning to share with you my thoughts, uh, especially in this interesting period, uh, on what I have. Uh, we're talking about building a resilient workforce. But you know, on the back of that, I'm going to be talking more on what the future of work you know, uh, is all about uh, and how that ties to building a resilient workforce. So clearly, uh, we are all in a period where, and I'm going to not, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We've spoken about it. 
uh, we know what, what what why we are here today or why I mean the session where we are in in terms of you know, the period uh, what is happening around us so that is fantastic we all know that so I want to skip that very quickly but I think what should be topmost in our mind is you know what what the f of every crisis that you have it in itself presents a lot of opportunities and the question will be how do we tap you know uh, to those opportunities so. Uh, again, like I said, we're all pretty much familiar with this. This keeps changing by day, so I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, it is similar to this, uh, we know what is happening around us. Uh, again, like, like um, the monitor had said, this is part of the, our body of knowledge. So we know what is happening. You know, businesses are crashing. The stock market, you know, has issues. Uh, we all, all of a sudden, move into the remote working culture. Uh, with cities around, you know, uh, our educational system being disrupted, health system. So a lot of things are actually being thrown at us at this point in time. But, and, you know, those that are being thrown, thrown at us at this point in time, in itself or in themselves, are clearly, you know, like I said earlier, it's a challenge, but also uh, pointing us in the direction that it's an opportunity for us to leverage on. But stepping back very quickly, prior to talking about, I mean, COVID-19 or, the, you know, before COVID-19, we have been talking about you know, something very interesting, and that is the future of work. Uh, and I'm sure I'm going to ask you what is the future of work. We're going to be talking about what is it very quickly, but I think it's important to know what is driving future of work. So I want to just talk about a couple of the trends. So uh, today, uh, we've seen you know, uh, some of the things you can see on the, I mean, the things you can see on the screen, uh, from technology going very exponentially to issues of data now becoming more essential for us. Uh, we all know we talk about data being the currency of today. I uh, will talk about things around the new uh, tools that we're using to enhance our work, you know, AI, cognitive, robotics. Uh, we we'll talked about, I mean, we we'll talk about the issue that jobs are becoming invulnerable uh, out to COVID and even with COVID. Uh, this issue around also having a different sort of workforce, what we call, what's, which is what we call the contingent workforce. So these are people who would uh, do a two day work with me. Uh, they do three days. They don't want to be a full-time staff. We have, you know, also have one major thing that it's, it's you know, it's staring at all of us, which is the issue of diversity, you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, and, and generational change. And uh, what does that mean? So we're having new people in the workplace and asking for new things. And of course, you know, COVID-19 is not, you know, helping matters. So just to put some context to that, we'll just quickly run, run you through a short video. So very quickly, just take it from, from that, that video, uh, you can see a lot of things. 
Uh, the fact that you know we're saying today everything is on the table. Now the future of work is, is upon us and is actually you know demanding a, a lot of things from us. So what then is future of work? I'm going to just run through that very quickly. Future of work today is basically saying when we look at all the various things changing our world, uh, whether it is technology, whether it is um, whether it is it, it is um, you know vulnerability of workforce and so on, you know jobs. The one thing that is critical is that this all these changes are bringing you know to the fore the fact that there are three elements that are connected, and those three elements are the elements that will shape how how we, I mean how we go on I mean how we go forward. Now, what are those three elements? So there's the work itself, there's the workforce, and there's the workplace. Now, so the question here is this: there's always there's always going to be work to be done. Then uh, we need the workforce to do the work, and of course, where should the work be done? So what this simply means is that going forward, you know, we, we begin to see things around the fact that the work that we do today will not go to be the same work we're going to be doing tomorrow. We also, also begin to see the fact that the work that we do today we are, are going to be such that we're going to be also be using leveraging of smart machines and robots to deliver on the work. Now the workforce is going to be diverse, like, you know, like we saw in that video. Uh, what does that mean? It simply means that the workforce of tomorrow will not be the typical you know, what we see nine to five workforce, we're going to be seeing people being flexi hours, we're going to be seeing contractors, we're going to be seeing uh, robots, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, and of course, big workers. And of course, the workplace will not be the traditional fiscal office, which means that we will not start talking about where do we work, do we work from home, do we work from, you know, some <clears throat> hubs, what do we need to do about where we work. So the point here is this, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that with the future of work, we're going to see a major shift in terms of what happens to our work, what happens to the workforce, and what happens to the workplace. And to that point, simply means that for us as individuals, a lot of things need to change. Uh, first and foremost, we need to start asking ourselves that question, right? How do we, you know, begin to relate ourselves in this whole new, 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 new era? How do we also pursue our passion? And more importantly, for organizations, how do we begin to redesign work? Because, like I said earlier, work will change. So how do we, how do we redesign work? How do we ensure that we also implement new ways of working? How does this affect the entire value chain of how we manage our people and HR and even all of us as leaders? Uh, again, for public you know, policy issue, now the question is, how do we begin to look at our policies? You will probably want to say this today that because we're talking to public servants, oh, there are policy issues, oh, they are there. So there will be tons and tons of reasons why we think, we think things will not work. But the reality is this the future of work is upon us. And we don't have a choice that we to look at these things if truly we want to be resilient. So what does this, this whole thing mean for us? So future of work basically you know, speaks to three things at the end of the day. So apart from being you know, the workforce, the workforce, and the workforce, the work and the workplace, it's actually trying to drive three major outputs or outcomes. So there's cost, there's value, and there's meaning. And these three major you know, outcomes you know, our outcomes that also begin to also speak to us as individuals, as a workforce, you know, us as government, and of course, even the citizens. What do we get, what do we give to them? So if you look at what you have on the screen, I'm, I'm, not, going to, I'm, not, I'm not going to run through all that. Well, clearly you can see that for every aspect, whether it's a customer, whether it's a customer, whether it's a workforce, whether it's a government, they are gains for us if truly we adapt to the future of work. So what is this all suggesting? What this is saying is that, with future of work, we are being led into what I call the new normal world, in the, in the sense that everything is now going to be on the table. The way we work, the way where we work, and how we do our work. And naturally, you will agree with me that in a period like this, three things that will probably you know, will need to happen in a period of crisis, and like I said, in a new normal world as well. It is first, it, we need to respond. We need to recover, we need to try. And the question is, how do we respond, how do we recover, how do we try? So as we probably see on the screen, uh, you see that you know, for us to respond, the first thing is that we must be resilient in our planning. If we cannot be resilient in our planning, then we cannot even respond, which means that we have to constantly you know, evolve. We have to <clears throat> excuse me, constantly change. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we have to constantly you know, also uh, you know, innovate. And that begins to also speak to things around how do we have the right leadership? You know, so like we see on the screen, it says, you know, we need to probably have what to call, I call the task force leaders, because at some point in time, 
uh, in as we respond, things are not going to be normal, right? And we need to be able to actually respond in some instances, in some unconventional way, because we probably do not have the right plans. I'm actually suggesting what to be done, which is exactly what we see today. Then, of course, we need to be able to enable, you know, flexible working, whether we like it or not. That becomes, you know, what becomes, you know, that becomes quite critical. And of course, we need to then have a clear strategy to communicate. You know, so you also see what to see on that recover, and then how do we thrive? So, but again, I and mean, what more does this suggest in this new normal world? It simply means for the work itself, we have to now be to think about how do we have an adaptive, adaptive ecosystem? How do we partner? You know, how do we, of course, talk about super jobs? So what does that mean, super jobs today? Saying the traditional jobs that we have will tend to disappear. Some of them will disappear. And what do they have is what we call the new, the new what we call the super jobs. And of course, how do we make work meaningful to our people? Then, of course, for the workforce, you know, we need to start thinking, how do we skill the, 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 our talent? How do we improve the human experience? How do we drive continuous learning? And how do we also drive that contingent workforce? And more importantly for the workplace, you know what, there are issues around how do we deal with remote, you know, uh, you know the, the remote work culture? How do we provide the right support? How do we support the culture of collaboration? How do you even, even ensure that our workplaces are smart enough for people to collaborate? So speaking, you know, on, on some other things that you then see uh, around the, the new rules in, in the new normal world, I face the privacy on the screen. So from so clearly, what is it saying that there will be a major shift from what we're used to to the new rules of, of working? So from how do we deal with how do we begin to see people going forward? Uh, do we just see people as workers or see them as people that are intelligent, are able to deliver value? How do we again more importantly, how do we deal with the issue of in, innovation? Yes, I think that we have OTCI, you know, um, which is a department fantastic, it is a great idea. But the truth is this, innovation going forward more become, should be a culture. It's not about a department. It's actually something that should permit the entire organization, uh, the entire you know, uh, service. And of course, you know, how do you also leverage on, on emotional intelligence? How do we break down the command and control leadership? Now, from a workforce point of view, like I did mention earlier, now this is going to be the new workforce. The old workforce is changing. We have a new workforce. Our employees, joint ventures, contractors, and so on. So what this is saying is that going forward, the workforce would be different. The competition would be different. And of course, where we work, which I've spoken about earlier, will also be different. Do you want to be, do you want to do physical, physical, or do you want to do uh, physical, virtual, or do you want to do a virtual, virtual? Now, all, what this is saying is that, like I did mention earlier, the workplace will transform dramatically. And to be honest, the truth is, for the workplace, now, we, I know we're dealing with, oh, do I do remote work or do I not do, do, I not do remote uh, work? But the truth is this, what we have seen is that for those who have gone that route, we have seen a lot of values being driven or being achieved. So there's been agility, we've seen quality, we've seen speed, and we've seen a couple of other things. So what this is saying is at the end of the day, we will need to make a choice as to where we want to be. But it's a continuum we must deal with. Do we want to do the virtual work? Do you want to do hybrid? Do you want to do the physical, you know, our workplace? And of course, how then do we move from here very quickly? For all of us on this, on this, 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 uh, this in the room, it's important that going forward, we have to now do three things: think, act, and react differently. How do we think differently? So, like you probably will see, you know, on the screen. Uh, so we we start with how do we see beyond the now? How do we begin to have what you call a cognitive skill? Where, of course, we start thinking and conceptualizing the new ways of working, not waiting until a COVID-19 or a similar COVID-19 will come upon us. Because what has happened today is the fact that some of the things we're doing today will stick. They will not change. They will stay with us. And of course, you know, how do we you know, uh, begin to think you know, from the point of how do we solve problems? You know, what do we think in terms of solving problems? How do we think divergently? How do we make decisions, you know, in a much faster way? And of course, how do we, you know, of course, act differently? And how do we, like I said earlier, which of course saying there must be a behavioral change. And the last point is the fact that there must be an emotional transformation. We cannot be resilient, you know, at different levels without having that emotional transformation, which of course means that we must learn to tolerate because there are going to be mistakes that will happen. 
you know, we must show resilience in the face of the change, constant change, which means we must be ready to, to constantly innovate ourselves, reinvent ourselves. We're going to fail at some point, but once we fail, we must try again. We should not give up. I will just quickly run through the last, just about two more slides, and I'm going to just hand, hand over at this point. So for us to be able to build and become resilient, and again, being able to imbibe the future of work, whether it is the workplace or the workforce or the, or, or the work itself, there are some you know, skills of the future. And you know, this has been shared at different, different sessions. So there are things around, you know, we must now begin to talk about communication, critical thinking, you know, um, leadership, adaptability, teamwork, mutual intelligence, having a good mindset, you know, collaboration, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think to bring this to a close, we're, today we're talking about remote, how do we work remotely? So the next couple of slides, I want to just leave us to, I want to leave us to, to deal with, uh, you know, uh, when we get this, 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 this deck, speaks to some of the uh, tips that we can use as we engage in terms of how we work. But just to, to summarize and close, it's important that you know, we, we live with this. And that's what I call the Specker principles. How do we support our teams? How do we create and share responsibility and trust? How do we appreciate progress over perfect, perfection? How do we promote visibility and clarity? How do we encourage healthy boundaries? And how do we ensure that we know ourselves and our team? This is going to be quite critical as we move forward, you know, as individuals, as organizations, as groups, other agency, ministry, or departments. So at this point, I'd like to pause and hand over to the moderator. Thank you very much, much Mr. Olofishola, for this um, uh, presentation. And if uh, you permit me to summarize, uh, especially for some of our participants who joined us a bit late. Uh, in talking about uh, the future of work and building a resilient uh, workforce, you were pointing our attention to the fact that there are new realities uh, that's uh, facing us. And you aptly termed those the seven disruptors plus one, plus one meaning COVID-19. And then your video, in, uh, which was very good, and uh, people were wondering why there was no sound. And I believe the intention was there was no sound. And it needed us to just listen or watch the video was showing attentively. But that's the reality of what artificial intelligence is bringing into the future of work. And in talking about the future of work, you talked about three elements that we need to focus on. You said the work, you talked about the workforce, as well as the workplace. And you said for these three elements, of course, the drivers have to deal with the cost, the value, as well as the meaning and how it relates to our customers internally and externally. I like uh, the fact that you also transitioned to talk about our response and how we recover and thrive during this period and going forward. And what you are calling us to is the fact, the new reality that uh, the future of work is about a compelling need for a different workforce of the future. And the one word I used to term that is agility. And the need for us to think differently in terms of our cognitive transformation, the need for us to act differently in terms of our behavioral transformation, and the need for us to react differently in terms of our emotional intelligence or transformation emotionally. And in summing up, you talked about SPECAC principles. SPECAC, the acronym being for support, uh, to create, to appreciate, to promote, to encourage, and of course, the need for us to know more. So thank you very much. Again, may I ask our participants, as we go along, 
And uh, let me take this opportunity to let us know that at the end of the session, we'll also uh, have a feedback form that we'll be posting online for our participants. So please post your Q&A questions as we go along and we'll be able to look at those questions together at the end of our second presentation. So at this point in time, it gives me great pleasure to invite um, one of us, and I say one of us, and for those who know why I'm saying one of us, I mean, well, do uh, you know why? And those who don't know, do your research, please. So one of us, uh, in the person of Mrs. Bumi Fabango, to give us her presentation. And may I enjoin all our listeners again to, to remind our listeners that this is an education series. And this is the second of the Resilience Workforce series. Over to you, Mrs. Fabamu. Thank you very, very much, um, TA. As we have been told, my name is Olukumi Fabamu, the chairman of the Lagos State Civil Service Commission. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this morning. It is indeed a privilege to be able to talk to oh, about 1,000 public servants as one. And who says we are not resilient? This is resilience in action. I would like us to remember something that was said. Lagos is a resilient city. Indeed, we have been identified as one of the 100 resilient cities by the Ford Foundation, by the Rockefeller Foundation. And our, own, our very own head of service, Mr. Hakim Muriokola, a few months ago, when the resilience strategy, the Lagos resilience strategy was launched, he said, and I quote him, the envisaged success in implementing the Lagos resilience strategy rests on the rank and file of the Lagos State Public Servants. He continued, the time has therefore come for the public service to retool, reboot for the future. The future that Mr. Joseph Olofishola has largely spoken about. New technologies, emerging realities, they all demand very proactive initiatives and innovative approaches to problem solving, administration, and governance. This was said by our, own, our very own head of service, Mr. Hakim Muri Okola, during the launch of the Lagos Resilience Strategy. So really, we are on the path. We as a government organization, we are aware that we, are, we operate in a very dynamic environment. Three months ago, nobody could have said that we would be speaking to a thousand public servants at a, at a forum like this, educating ourselves, engaging each other. As a nation, as a world, things have changed. Imagine a virus, just a virus, we are told, has crashed economies has broken healthcare systems, indeed has caused a global pandemic. It, some people have said that we're not just in a VUCA world that we all know, but that we are now in a VUCA world, meaning that we're in very volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and the D, disruptive, that the world has indeed become VUCA. And so it is saying that strategic ability is being required at this point in time. TA mentioned about agility. Agility really is the ability to be able to move very quickly, to be able to do things easily, to be able to understand, to think quickly, to be nimble, to be swift to take actions. And you will agree with me that a time like this, confirms that when we are faced with an emergency as a state, as a nation. 
So really the paradigm is shifting, even from the leadership level. They're looking at strategic agility in order for us to build adaptive structures within the public service that can quickly respond to very contemporary public sector issues and demands. So let's quickly try and see resilience. I mean, we, we know, many of us understand the word resilience. And just for emphasis, I'd like to say that it's a process of adapting well in the face of changes, especially sometimes negative changes. And it's a way, it means bouncing back from some difficult, not so positive um, instances. And of course, these are our various types. I mean, they happen to us. Life happens. We say life happens. And the ability to come back again is, can be termed part of resilience. And so I would take this from the point of individual resilience and build it onto our own public service resilience. Quickly, we have tried to define uh, individual resilience, which is the capability of an individual to cope successfully in the face of significant change. The world is changing, new technologies. We couldn't have done this a couple of years ago. We know what WhatsApp has done, even to, in terms of communication. So many other applications, things are really changing. Things that looked complex. Some people have found solutions that are pretty, similar, pretty um, simple to deal with them. So this is a challenge to us as public servants that we have to begin to totally rethink, and we have started it in some of our sectors. We are aware that there have been changes. We have been able to respond to the demands of the citizens. Citizens are more informed, they are more demanding. And so resilience in the workforce will certainly demand also an enabling environment a resilient environment, an environment that will support resilience. I'm aware that this is clear to our leadership, that indeed for us to hone employee resilience, workforce resilience, there's a lot that needs to be done. So we as public servants, what kind of characteristics are we looking at for a, a resilient person? Of course, we as public servants must have a sense of control all the time. We must have very strong problem solving skills, excellent social connections, desire to collaborate and collaborate. And so I will look at, talk about collaboration. Collaboration is key, very, very key in the delivery of our service in terms of being resilient. Imagine an emergency like this has happened now. Our Ministry of Health is collaborating with the national body, with the, with the, nation, with the federal bodies, primary health care, they're working across agencies. So a very, very strong collaboration culture is required, cross-functional fertilization. It builds resilience even in a system. And a system is the processes, a system is the procedures, a system is the people. So we are looking at collaborative public servants, and that, of course, will build resilience into the system. We're looking at public servants who have great problem solving skills. We would have to acquire those skills, acquire the skills. And as Joseph has said, we must be prepared to try out things. We might fail, but we must continue. And we have to have a spirit that says, you are not on your own. We are, the on your own syndrome must stop. We must be collaborative. If something happens, and then we come together and say, how can we change this? How can we redo it? The on your own syndrome would have to give way to a more collaborative spirit. So we talked about the resilience enabling leadership. We are, at whatever level we are, we are leaders in our own way, but more so at the leadership of agencies, of ministries, 
we've got to, we have got to motivate. And what do I mean by motivate? I mean motivate in every way, in terms of recognizing, recognizing good behavior, good output, good outcomes, rewarding it, acknowledging it. And that will take us to even the way we do our performance management. What are those values? What are the outcomes we are looking at? Do we need to overhaul our performance management system to be a resilient workforce? These are questions we will be asking ourselves. In 20 minutes, we, it's a conversation. It's just starting, we're starting this conversation and it can't end with this webinar. I know and I'm sure that there are so many ideas that will come from the public servants to make all of this work. We have to begin to rethink the things we do, how we do it. Let's look at the HR value chain. How we recruit. How do we recruit? Thankfully, some of our commissions have begun to take advantage of, of automation of technology. And they're beginning to do some things very, very differently. We just have to continue that way. Technology-driven recruitment that confirms meritocracy. We have to adopt automation more. We have adopted, but we have to look at our processes and procedures and policies. It may mean rewriting some of those policies while not losing the essence of those policies in terms of accountability, in terms of transparency. Automation will have to be very, very key. We have to look at our jobs. Let's look at our cadres. Do we have obsolete cadres? Are there cadres that we need to retweak? Are there cadres that we need to enhance in terms of the job schedules? This is the time to begin to think about that. In some other sectors, some jobs have gone. Do we want to wait until our jobs go in public service before we rethink the jobs? I'm sure the answer is no. So this is a good time to start the conversation. Even in the cadres we are, do we need to acquire new skills? No, do we need to acquire new skills? The issue of lifelong education becomes important. It is not just enough to acquire degrees. It is not enough to acquire degrees and want to change from one cadre to the other. We must develop the proficiencies, the competencies on an ongoing basis. I go back again to the role of leadership in enabling resilience. It is clear that we must continually motivate we must communicate. We must communicate extensively. We must communicate to our team honestly. We must communicate with them. Even the challenges we have as leaders, these are very, very, very key. So the, the skill to communicate must continuously be in service. And so we look at these overlapping and mutually reinforcing behaviors that encourage resilience. You will find that some of the things that encourage resilience, adaptability becomes important. Nobody likes to leave their comfort zone. But if you don't look, leave your comfort zone, you'll be wondering who moved my cheese. Learning is critical. Learning, continuous learning, continuous learning, no matter what level you are. And we must be able to have a system in the performance management we are, we are able to, to monitor and reward continuous learning. And of course, network leveraging, which also hones into collaboration. Building resilience in the workplace, I would say, really begins with you and I. We've got to make that personal decision also, because we are part of the workforce. And so even when new methods are introduced, we must have a way to say, okay, let's try it. We shouldn't begin with, it can't work. The Kole work syndrome. Let us try it. Let's give it a try. We might meet some obstacles, then we redo. 
then we rethink, we redesign. So really, a resilient workforce begins with you and I. It has a we must have a problem mind, problem solving mindset. Expect it. A resilient workforce is one that looks at the has the end in mind. What will this thing become? What will it be like? And so you can, when you have the end in mind, you're able to look at the process, the problem-solving mindset. You must be ready to make mistakes. And our system must also recognize that, especially mistakes that are not of the head, but mistakes that are not of the heart, but mistakes that are done in, the, in trying to do the best. We must, there will be challenges. These, as we speak, are very, very challenging times in the history of the world. COVID-19, nobody has worked this part before. We must also be very optimistic as a resilient workforce. And we act in a very pragmatic manner. The theories will always be there to provide the framework, but we drill it down and see how we can contextualize it and make it work for us. Very resilience, tough times are sometimes inevitable. And as some people say, things just happen. But you can always control the response to those times. Does resilience just happen? No, it is built over time. And I believe that we in Lagos states, we are putting on the building blocks for a resilient workforce, workforce to support a resilient city, the city of Lagos. Openness and transparency become so important and we cannot talk about it enough. And of course, agendas, agendas, agendas. Eliminating any hidden agenda and perceptions of such too. And that talks in the place of openness, transparency, and carrying the team along. We must begin to look at our committees also. Our committees, I know that we're hierarchical in service, but at the same time, we must begin to, begin to look at committees that cut across, committees that, ha that have introduced diversity into them. We must have committees probably that cut across cadres, are cut across grade levels because you never know where the next bright idea can come in service. Therefore, I would like us to consider very quickly that times are changing. Expectations of the citizens are, are much more demanding than ever before. The role of technology begins to be very, very crucial. And so I would like to charge us let us determine to be resilient. Let us practice resilience. Let's continue to be resilient. Governments and governments such as ours, like Lagos State, Africa's model mega city, we require a resilient workforce that can not only survive, but that can thrive and thrive in the face of challenges and adversity, that can thrive in the face of new technology that can thrive in the face of new demands by the citizen and even the workforce itself and all our stakeholders. Thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, my dear sister, Mrs. Uh, Fabangwo. And um, she started off uh, her presentation on that uh, high note, uh, talking about Lagos. So in fact, not talking, declaring, she actually made a declaration that Lagos is a resilient city. And she quoted from our very own head of service, Mr. Akim Okwala, to attest to that declaration. She then talked about the fact that a lot of us know about the acronym VUCA, but she says it's now VUCAD. So VUCA is about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, as well as ambiguity. But the D now that makes it VUCAD 
is about disruption. And indeed, that is what COVID-19 has thrown on us. So very ingenious. I think um, in Nigeria, we should post it to the rest of the globe that it's now VUCA and not VUCA. Right. And uh, she then talked about the definition of resilience, which is uh, a process of, ad uh, of adapting and bouncing back. And ladies and gentlemen, let me, when we talk about the fact that something is a process, it means day by day we're working on it. We're working on something. We're getting closer to a destination. So if, uh, Resilience is a process of adapting. Uh, she reminded us in that definition, it's about bouncing back as well. And then she took a narrow look at individual resilience as well as employee resilience, which is really about being collaborative, the problem solving mind mindset. And then of course, she talked about the resilient enabling leadership that we so earnestly desire within the public sector and the call to or the charge to leaders in terms of their role which is to motivate to communicate as well as articulate and so there's a call for leaders to refine behaviors that encourage resilience and what are these behaviors it's about adaptability it's about uh uh, uh, learning mindset and it's about uh, leveraging on networking. Uh, if I may sum up what she said about adaptability because she talked about who moved my cheese. Well, permit me to say it's not about who moved my cheese anymore, but the fact that this cheese has moved. It's like saying this train has left the station, right? So where are we? Which of the coaches are we within the train? Our cheese, all of us, our cheese has already been moved. And so she talked about uh, building, uh, the fact that building resilience begins with you. I choose to be resilient. And of course, I mean, Elogosia, how can you talk this speak and not add in uh, 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 lingua. She said this attitude of kole walk, right? Uh, this attitude of kole walk cannot uh, be tenable anymore. So it's about I choose to be resilient. I choose to have a problem solving mindset. I choose to be ready to make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. I choose to begin with the end in mind. I choose to be optimistic to be pragmatic and have an open mindset, to be transparent without any hidden agenda. She challenged the fact that we should look at the way committees uh, uh, work across the cadres. And in summary, I would say a lot of what she was saying alludes to that saying that says, tough times don't last, but tough people do. So all we're asking for Lagos State is a resilient workforce that is determined to be resilient, that will practice resiliency, and will continue to forge ahead in resilience in this um, new world, the new normal for us. So thank you very much once again, and thank you also uh, Mr. Olofinshola Olof for your earlier presentation. This is a time where we will open the floor to Q&A. And please, uh, I had announced earlier that you should post your questions in the Q&A box, but I'm sure we'll be able to entertain some live questions as well. And so I would need some of the supporting team to help me in this regard. Uh, there are quite a number of questions. So I really, well, let me start this way. Uh, there was a question that was posed earlier on. It said, what can be done to get a lazy worker to become a resilient worker? 
Well, first things first, I don't know what the speaker means by lazy worker because a lazy worker is relative. But the question is, what can be done to get a lazy worker to become a resilient worker? Uh, Mrs. Fabangwo, will you be able to answer that question for us, please? Um, thank you very much. What can be done to get a lazy worker? <laughs> I think we need to first of all define lazy. What job did we give the worker to do? Is there clarity? Did we indicate to the worker our expectations and consequences for expectations not met? So, yes, you may have a supposedly lazy worker, but it behoves on us as supervisors to give clarity to the job role, to define the expectations, to monitor performance, to look at sanctions and uh, consequences and sanctions. So it goes back to us as supervisors. Let's go back to define the job, the role, the expectations. And then we can come back and look at the lazy worker. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, quite enlightening. Uh, may I also say, please, um, if we have questions, you can also raise up your hand by using the raise hand uh, button in the chat, in the, in the, once you tap your screen, there's a button that says raise your hand so that, like I said, we'd like to uh, entertain live questions and at the same time, take on some of the questions in the Q and the A box. Whoa, there are quite a number of questions. I really wonder how we can prioritize uh, this part of the, of the session to make sure that uh, we, we handle as many questions as possible. Now, let me say this, that... Um, if you raise your hand and we call you to speak, please mention your name. Or, I mean, just mention your name and perhaps uh, which, where within the Lagos State Establishment you are from. Um, again, please use the raise hand button that we have. So there's a question from Olushola Kolawole. It says, how do we quickly put in place supporting policies for this new initiative. I believe the initiative is all about the resilient workforce and some of the things we've talked about. Um, Mr. Olof, inshallah, can you help us in that answer, please? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, the moderator. I, I think you know, that, that, that question could be addressed from two perspectives. Um, yeah, and back to what uh, Mrs. Fabawa had said earlier, I, I, I think to a large extent, we, we kind of, and permit the use of my language, uh, policy becomes an excuse uh, when some things really could be done uh, creatively. So first and foremost, I think uh, there's a level of creativity that we require. There's a level of suggestion that needs to come from us. And more importantly, of course, I do agree that looking at the entire value chain, there's some policies that will have to happen or will have to change. And I think, you know, Lagos State is in the forefront. I've seen a couple of things that have, that have, been, that have been done. Uh, but again, the question will be, um, you know, so the answer rather, you know, will be, yes, policies will be changed, or policies can be changed. But more importantly, let's start with ourselves. Uh, I always tell people, be the change you want to see. You know, when you start, you be the one that will be that change. So that would be my, my response. Okay, thank you very much. And so whilst I still have you on, uh, please uh, leave your mic on. Uh, there's this other question from yesterday, Fanu, and she says, uh, in view of the huge number of staff employed by government, how do we get the staff to buy into these current realities? So in your presentation, uh, you had talked about the current realities. So her question is, how do we get the government to buy, uh, um, 
in view of the huge number of staff employed by government, how do we get staff to buy into these current realities? All right. Thank you very much. So again, I, 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 I will address that from two, two, two perspectives. So now the first thing is this, um, the fact that we have, uh, you know, that, you know, massive number of people or, you know, staff that, you know, uh, it is not, shouldn't be a challenge in terms of buying. So let's talk about what are those, you know, new realities. Uh, first and foremost, we talk about the things that are really upon us, and that's, that's for sure, you know, uh, that we cannot change. So the whole thing is we need them begin to move. We need to move the needle. Uh, so to, to that point, so the first thing the government needs to do clearly is there should be a high level of awareness. And I think this is a part of the awareness which is, has been done uh, by, by the Ministry of, of, of you know, staff, which is, I think is quite, quite you know, uh, you know, uh, commendable. So that's the first thing that needs to happen. Now, the second thing that needs to happen, so there is the, so, um, so there is first the, there's a leadership buy-in, which is already in, uh, which is already, uh, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's already, you know, um, uh, in as we speak, or probably that has already been done. Uh, then, of course, moving to, to cascade it down to the next level, which is, which is part of what the ministry is doing. So I think first the awareness needs to happen. The second thing that needs to happen is the fact that we need to also begin to see the benefits that comes with this. So we know we need to say what is the need for us, you know, for every for everyone. But I could say clearly that there's a lot that can be done. So that's the second thing that needs to happen. Now, the third thing that needs to happen is the fact that at our own very, you know, level, back to what, you know, we did mention earlier with Tim Asif and Mrs. Fabanwo, resilience starts from you also being, uh, uh, you know, being, being part of the solving the problem, not waiting for the, you know, uh, because I want to say, how can governments, right? The question is, who is the government? We are all part of the government. So what is your role in, in driving this? So for me, it has to do, so there's a top-down approach as a bottom-up approach for us to solve the problem. Okay, thank you And very of course, much. we also need to speak to what are the low-hanging fruits? Uh -huh. Today, Today, for instance, I mean, I, I, I had to rush my presentation, but that's fine. If, if you look at what, what you will get at the end of the day, you probably see where I had put some uh, tips are, I mean, in terms of how can we migrate, how can we move from where we are today to the next level. And clearly seeing that we may need to tell ourselves, there are three, four, five, seven critical MDAs or agencies, as I mean, sorry, MDAs, whether it's municipal agencies or government. And again, looking at that from the theme agenda, can we begin to look at low hanging fruit? Can we start with these MDAs and agencies? I'm sorry, this MD, I keep saying this, this MDAs. And on the back of that, you know, whatever outcomes we we'll get, that becomes lessons that we can learn from, and we can now replicate those things in other uh, MDAs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's about looking at the low hanging fruits and being able to, starting with some pilots and being able to replicate over a period of time. Very good. Uh, Thank you for your responses. Uh, Mrs. Fabanwo, there's a question here. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, person says Infinix. Uh oh, I've lost that question. It was from Infinix. Uh, there was no name and it was like, okay, with all the government edifices and what have you, what will the government do in terms of revamping its culture? This is far the question back. again, you? The question well, again, um, uh, It's gone out of sight if um, I'm not in control of these buttons anymore. But the question okay. was uh, alluding to the fact that the government has set up a lot of edifices and structures, uh, possibly talking about the buildings and all that. So what's the new culture? How would we roll along in terms of from a culture perspective or culture change perspective or mindset? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, culture, as we know, is what you and I continue to do, what is acceptable. And um, if you recall, Lagos State, we started a few years ago with having a service culture. I'm sure some of us will remember the service charter day. Service charter, when it was so strong in our service. Again, we moved on and we found that it was important to have a growth mindset. And here we are talking about a res resilient workforce. They are all intertwined. 
at the end of the day, it's ha having a service culture, understanding the role that we are public servants, we are employed to deliver public goods. So if we understand from that aspect, it is not a culture that somebody would bring upon you. It is what we will be knowing why we are in the service. Again, the end in mind. Why am I employed as a health officer? Why am I employed as a teacher? Why am I employed as an engineer in service? Okay. Understanding all of that. So culture is sometimes inbuilt. When you bring in your culture, and then the culture of the organization is cemented. So it isn't about government bringing culture. I, more of it is about an understanding of your own role. And then the government will ensure that there's an ambience, there's an environment that continually hones the culture, service culture. How do we greet people when they come into our offices, for example? Do we have uh, an attitude of, uh-huh, as you come to our office and all of that, or do we quickly get up, sit up straight? Oh, how can we help you? How what do you need to have done here? So these are the things which we begin to look at. These are the issues, the culture, okay. starting from you as a person, and then what culture does the system itself recognize and reward continuously? Okay. Those are, are very important. Very good. Uh, so it's about defining that culture, what it means to everyone, and how do we reward it? So whilst I have you on, uh, Mrs. Fabangwo, there's this question from George Fayoye. He says, how can a leader manage the followers who are most senior or older than him or her in case they prove stubborn and not ready to abide with the leader's rules and regulations? <laughs> I'm sure you will understand that being an insider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think again, it goes on to foundation, the clarity, clarity, clarity. Now you are a younger person maybe, and you have older people who are probably reporting to you. That looks like a scenario. Okay. Once the job is clear, and then you also understand the cultural aspect of our nation and of us as Africans. The job clarity is very important. Mm -hmm. The communication skills you also have to, to, to carry your team along. It, the clarity of the role and the expectations and then how you communicate that is going to be very, very important. So while when you manage other people, there is a sense of respect is a value. It should not override the work. There's a sense of respect. If somebody doesn't want to be called by the first name, then don't call the person by the first name. Miss so so and so, Mrs. So so and so, and get the work done. The critical thing which we need to go back to is clarity of the job itself, clarity of the goals, clarity of the rewards and sanctions. Right? Okay, very good. So it's about clarity, 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 and it's really about communication. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm just looking at some comments here. Somebody says, oh, I'm so proud to be uh, an employee within the Lagos State Government. This is excellent. That's good. Um, I've got another question here from Kemiduro Simieti. And a question says, how do you secure government data or information when working remotely? How do you secure government data or information when working remotely? And uh, Mr. Olof, inshallah, can you help us in answering that question, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all right, thank you very much. I, I, I think, um, so, First and foremost, um, when we talk about securing data, uh, whether you are working physically or you are working remotely, you know, your data could be hacked, your system could be hacked into. That's number one. Okay? 
So the fact that you're working remotely or you're not working with artists now, however, the risk that you're working remotely because now you are now almost 24 seven, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on, the, on, on the system and that expo exposes you to risk. And that's why I would say, you know, if, if we get back to this, this, this slide I show on, uh, you know, the new workplace, right? Now, on that, it's that slide, you probably see we talk about technology infrastructure. You know, so clearly we must be able to put the right infrastructure in place. How do we manage cyber risk? That becomes quite important. How do we ensure that, you know what, uh, so for instance, let me give you an example. I mean, I sit here today, I mean, and, and, and we're doing this, this, this whole session. And someone rightly could be watching this session without any one of us knowing. Again, so it's the function is how do we put those, you know, um, 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 safeguards in place? So there's, so that's why we, whatever we talk about today, uh, and it, it, I, I mean, I alluded to one of the, the things I said earlier in terms of how technology has grown exponentially, giving us a lot of opportunity, opportunities rather. The, the question, however, is we are not catching up with these opportunities. So. My, my answer in, in, in summary is the fact that whether you work remotely or physically, those, I mean, your data, you know, could be hacked into, your could be hacked into, and therefore you could lose your data. So that could be leaks. But more importantly, it goes back to how do we reinforce our technology, you know, infrastructure to the point that we can actually ring fence our data and keep it. And again, that also goes to you as individuals, right? So there, Things, you know, as we speak today, I mean, if I, if I look at my office, we, we keep issuing every day, you know, tips, guides, when you work on your system, what you need to do, how to protect your system. When you see an email that you, have, you don't know that's coming, coming from names you don't know, you know, don't open it. So there are all manner of things that we can do to safeguard, uh, you know, uh, um, so, you know, uh, to, to safeguard um, what we call government data personally. And also as organization, and more importantly, how our IT systems actually contribute. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm going to shift a bit and call some of those whose hands are raised. And uh, so I will call them two by two. So the first person is Mr. Chesson Odukoya. And so if our admin can help release his hand. So again, the rule is once your name is called and your hand is released, please introduce yourself briefly and then just zoom into your question. If you're telling us stories, I'm sure I, I'm afraid I will have to cut in. And as Chesson is getting ready, I'd like to ensure that Olubukola Bakari is getting ready as well. So over to you, Chesson Dukoya. Please ask us your question. Thank you. Your, can he be unmuted, please? He's been unmuted. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, I can hear yeah. you, Chesson. Shoot. Okay. Good afternoon, man. Good afternoon. This yeah. is a good, good. welcome development uh, from Thank the you. state government. And um, we will ensure the, to work with this. But I want to say something. How do we ensure sustainability of this initiative? Sorry, Chesson. Chasson, yes, we, we've seen your name, but uh, where, which of the, where within the Lagos State Establishment uh, Organization? I, I work with Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources. Okay. Mineral, Minister, Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources, that's where I work. Man. Fantastic. So please uh, repeat your question again. I do, well, I appreciate this. What I want to say is that I do ensure sustainability of this initiative outside these um, um, this season and thereafter. That's what I'm worried about because it develop it depends on so many things that surround it. Like the, the 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 network, the internet facility is very key. Power is also key. So I want to say how do you report to ensure stability of this program? Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you, Shaso. I think you've answered the question yourself, actually. <laughs> but, but I'd like uh, Mrs. Fabango to answer his, uh, give us a response. How do you ensure the sustainability of this novel initiative? Okay, thank you very much, Shaso Odukoya. Where there is a will, 
there will always be a way. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that a Minister of Establishment Training and Pensions that has started this will do deep collaboration with, the mini with other ministries that need to make this a success. So be assured, I'm sure that um, it will be sustained. As long as you want it, you have the customers. And if you say you want it, so shall it be. Thank you very much. Oh, very good. I love that response. You are the customers. And it's just that awareness that our customers are internal as well as external. So, Bukola Bakari. Oh, yes, please. Uh, Mr. Olof, Inshallah. Yes. Okay, so just to, to add to what Mrs. Farmer would say, uh, you know, my, my, my interpretation of that question uh, has two, two parts. So sustainability of what we're doing at the moment, that is one, that is what the speaker is talking about, uh, or the, the person who asked the question, and sustainability of this whole, um, you know, what happens beyond COVID-19, right? Uh -huh. So I, I think this, this you know, the, the first thing that must be, uh, we must all agree to or admit is the fact that you know everything is on the table number one so the center it's not likely to hold anymore number two mm -hmm. number three is the fact that some of the things we do now are going to stick uh number four is the fact that just like the farmer was said uh when you know customers you know uh are becoming more sophisticated and their needs are being redefined every day. If whatever today uh, Lagos is able to do to me as a customer becomes the default mode of going forward. You know, so my question will be if they can do it at this point using this particular medium, why are we reverting to something that prior to now I didn't even like? So to that point, you know, so we need all me to, to admit the fact that things will have to change going forward. And once things change, you know, going forward, it's also, you know, important, and it is, you know, upon all of us also say, what role do I have to play? What role do we play as leaders? What role do we play as, and I want to say leaders, maybe a step back again, leaders, I think we need to clarify leaders. Leaders, when I'm using the word leader, I'm using the word leaders from a distributed point of view. And what does that mean? It means that, Everybody is a leader. You're either leading yourself, you're leading, you know, some uh, uh, people, you're leading managers, or you're leading a ministry or an agency or a department. So every one of us, we're all leaders. And to that point, you know, in our, you know, different capacities, we have a role to play to ensure that this actually, you know, becomes a culture. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you very much. I like the fact that you say that all of us are leaders. And so there's an imminent role and an urgent call for all of us to do one thing or the other. So uh, thank you. And uh, Bukola Bakari, I see you on. So we're going to unmute you. But before she comes on, I'd like two more people to get ready so that they can verbalize the questions. And that's Akinwumi Renike. Uh oh. <laughs> Akiwumi, Murenike, and then George Oyoye. <coughs> so, Bukola, you're <coughs> muted, and I hope you're safe. I can hear some in your household making noise. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ma. Yes, good morning. Yes. Um, I, my I hope is... you're safe. Yes, we are. We are. It's actually my daughter. <laughs> okay. Go yeah. On. Good morning, Ma. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bukola Bakari. I work with the Lagos State Ministry of Information and Strategy. Now, my question is for Mr. Olofi Shola. Um, while he was making his presentation, he mentioned us th that um, we need to plan, you know, in order to be resilient officers. I just want him to highlight some of the planning mechanisms we can adopt at this time. Okay, very good. Over to you, Mr. Olofi Shola. All right, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, just just on uh, you know, aside, you know, uh, part of what will be shared after now is also how do you manage your kids at this point in time? So, so, I like that. You know, it's going to be part of this slide that's going to be coming to to all, all of us yes. all, because it is critical at this point. Um, okay, so 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 that, that so but let's let's talk to the question. Uh, so talking about how we plan, 
right. Uh, again, I'm going to just, you know, take you back to part of the presentation. So when you talk about plan, first and foremost, uh, the question is there's always work to be done, right? So there is work to be done. That's number one. Number two, it's there must be work outcomes. You know, so the work to be done must be understood. The work outcomes must be clear. That's number two. Number three, what is required to deliver on the work must also be clear, right? Now, number four, where and how the work will be delivered must also be clearly articulated, right? Now, number five, again, going back to, um, you know, what Sama was said, so um, I could actually call it Vuka, 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 Vuka A, but let's just, let's stick with that several, <laughs> because there are several Vukas now as we speak. But the truth is, how do we sense, you know, in the course of your planning, you must sense risk. That's also quite important because you must recognize the fact that things are not going to work you know, the way you plan all the time. And therefore you must build that into your plan. That's where the resilience comes in, right? So, and the number, f I don't know, I'm, I'm talking about number five now. Number six, I hope, I hope the number caller four. can follow. So number four five. Now. Number five now. Number five, it's, we have to think about, you know, from the point of when I said, who and you know, um, you know, what do I require to do the work and who should do the work? And that's where the whole idea, a concept of again being agile comes in. So being agile, I'll try and differentiate between being agile and agility to some to some extent. So the, the whole concept of agile being agile is the fact that we must be willing to make to uh, what do you call it? We must, we must recognize the fact that we will fail at some point. So failure is not a it, it's not for us to stop. So once we fail once, it is for us, it's just for us to it's, it's for us to know how not to do those things or whatever we have done again. So and that needs to also be built into our planning process. Right. So once all that are done, and the next thing is that you must be able to once you put all those things together, you know, again, also looking at possible scenarios that will happen, that all those elements helps you to put a plan together, right? Which you can then share with you know, perhaps your stakeholders who need to work on what, who need to deliver. And of course, you must have, like I said, work outcomes are very clear and must be clearly defined. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very um, much. Yes, yes, yes. I'd, like say what, I'd like to say a bit about that also. Sure. In please. addition to what, hello? Yes, go on. I'd like go to on. say a bit, a bit more. In mm -hmm. addition to what um, Joseph has said, in our context, planning, we all know and we have a ministry of economic planning and budgets. But the truth is said, we must make it practical and real in our MDAs. Okay. Planning should not be the work of the planning officer alone and possibly the head of agency. All departments must sit down and plan. We almost get familiar with all our planning documents. And so planning to be an aggregate, our budget and at the end of the year should be an aggregate of all our plans as an agency. These are some of the things that need to change in service. Planning officer is not the one who is meant to plan for us. No, we are to plan. And then the planning officer's role is to co coordinate all of that with the head of agency, streamline everything. So we must have a paradigm shift in planning in the public service. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And uh, with your intonation and uh, where you stress, obviously you're passionate about this and this is a call to action. Planning is for everyone. All right. Noted. Well, we just have about five more minutes to round up and uh, it's amazing. Where does time normally fly to. So I, we still have two people that I had uh, indicated, Akumi Morenike and then George Fayoyi, please uh, you'll be next. So Akumi, your hand is lowered and you are unmuted. Morenike Akumi. Morenike Akumi. Okay, if uh, she's not ready, I, I believe it's a she. Can we move to George Fayonyi? 
George, you're unmuted. Good afternoon. Good morning. It's afternoon now, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Shukin Tav from Barriga Junior Grammar School, Barriga Legal. My question is this, ma'am. How can a leader cope in the midst of followers who are older than him or her and always reluctant to abide with his rule and regulation? That's question number one. My question number two, how can a resilient person be detected in a big establishment? Thank you. Uh, George, I didn't hear you too clearly, but I think that your first question was uh, dealt with uh, by Mrs. Fabamwood. Your second question, can you repeat it again, please? How can a resilient, what did you uh, say? Question, be determined in the big establishment. How can we recognize a resilient person in the okay. big establishment? Okay, how can we recognize a resilient person in a big establishment? All right, Mrs. Fabam, over to you. Uh, you need to unmute, Mrs. Fabam. Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. I said I would have loved to understand the question in its right context. Because he said, how can we recognize a resilient person in a large MDA? Mm -hmm. um, since um, our caller is co coming from the school, could it be that he's saying, for example, if we have a teacher that exhibits resilience, how can such a person be recognized? Could it be that? If it is that, then I would say that a tree may not be able to make a forest, but at the same time, a tree can make a difference. Therefore, we will be looking at putting some resilience factors even in our performance management to show evidence of resilience, for example. Therefore, it's not just one teacher attempting to be resilient, but it will become more of them we haven't that. There will even be indicators of people who have shown resilience. Mm -hmm. There could be challenging situations in schools. Yet you find a teacher who goes beyond the call of duty to still perform. And so those things can be noted as we begin to do performance management. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um Akim Moranika Akimi, I see you you've been unmuted. So we've got literally two more minutes to close up. So make it short and sharp. Morenike, Akumi, your question, please. Okay. Uh, she's been unmuted, but we still cannot hear her. Okay, well, um, I see you've been unmuted, Morenike. All right, well, uh, we must bring this session to a close. And I dare say, because we were oversubscribed, we had put in a contingency plan, and that plan is possibly to run another session later on this afternoon. Uh, but if I may summarize all what we've heard today from our two presenters, it's really about a call to action with regards to the resilient workforce. Indeed, it's a new dawn for Lagos State, the resilient city. But I want to add that with these two presentations, I can aptly say that Lagos State or the Lagos State government and its workforce, they're a smart city as well. So this is a call to action in terms of the new normal with regards to the future of work. And let us know that we need to redefine our customers and we need to redefine our customers' needs. But above all, there's a lot of work that we ourselves need to do 
in our teams and in our MDAs. It's about being agile and it's about making agility uh, uh, a watchword for all of us. And, and so with this, I'd like to say thank you to all those that have dialed in and we look forward to you embracing all that you have learned. Thank you to our two presenters. And uh, may I end with the lingo, Ekoni Bajo. Over to you, Mr. Bangboye, to close us out. It's uh, TA, sorry, I'd like to just say a few words. Oh. Um, it's actually Igbega Ipileko Ajumoshe Bobuani. That is the BOS. Oh, Oh, okay. uh, that's your own learned slogan but uh, mine is just to sum it up to say yes we have started this so it will not it, it can only get better thank you thank you very much um i'm going to start by saying just quoting from what ta said earlier she said the train has left the station you know this train has left the station um, and the truth of the matter is that disruption has happened. We do not have a choice um, but to move forward. This is not um, a situation of us thinking whether we can be resilient or we need to be resilient. We have to be resilient as a government, as a workforce, and as individuals. So, you know, the, this particular series, the resilience series, is really our own response in METP to get ourselves ready for overcoming adversity, overcoming crisis, and for us to get the conversation started about what we need to do to do that. Um, one of us, somebody asked a question earlier on that how will we ensure that this continues? The webinar series is actually part of our strategy for this year in METP, our learning management, our online learning strategy. We are really dedicated and focused on ensuring that we engage the workforce on various platforms. Um, you know, employee engagement is important, knowledge sharing is important. For many of you, you heard about shift that happened, I think it was February, a couple of months ago. That's also another initiative for us to to, to, to get together and to share knowledge um, within and from outside the civil service. So it's just for me, before um, I, I ask the PS to say his vote of thanks, um, just to summarize, I think we have learned a lot with that there have been useful insights from this presentation. Um, one thing that I, I can also say is that the Ministry of Science and Technology, the, the, the government, um, Babaji Somolu's government is particular about automation, smart city, and we keep saying that we cannot have a smart city without a smart campus. So the, there is already a project that has started um, where um, science and technology are actually upgrading the infrastructure. Um, we cannot talk about the future of work without the technology infrastructure being in place to support, like the skeleton, to support what we need to move ourselves um, to that future. So they have already started on the Alausa campus, automating, networking. I know that they have put some very serious security protocols in place to ensure security of data, um, the VPNs and what have you. I mean, it's a project that is almost, well, it's on, it's, it's on its way. Parts of it are completed, parts of it is still going on. Um, this is really for me about us, um, we, we, we've already started with um, the growth mindset. It's nothing new to the service. So it's not, um, we, we've been talking about culture, culture for a long time. And as I said in the webinar on Monday, or is it, um, was it yesterday or Tuesday, that this isn't about culture transformation anymore. It's really for us about culture evolution. It's for us to look at what we have on ground to see what we need because we cannot throw away the baby with the bathwater. We have a, a lot of good aspects of the civil service culture that we still need to get us to where we need to go to. And then for us, it's really identifying those things, telling us ourselves that we will keep the good. And then what do we need to move ourselves forward? What are the behaviors, the, the different things that we need to do to move ourselves to the greater Lagos um, of our dreams. I mean, one of the things that I know that um, 
has caused a lot of stirs within the civil services. Mr. Governor's announcement at the shift that um, the appointment of permanent secretaries will now be by, by assessment instead of just mere, you know, those things for us is part of it. It's an indicator that we are focusing on leadership and we appreciate the role that leadership has to play in actually setting um, the culture that we want that will deliver on uh, the promise of a greater Lagos. We're looking at high performance culture. It's not easy to change. We recognize, we recognize that, but um, it, it, the journey of a thousand miles, as they all say, as we all know, starts with one step. Once we are all committed, we're all involved in, in or bought in to um, the fact that things have to change. Um, I am sure that from the top up and from the bottom up, we will, um, to the best of our own knowledge, do what we need to do to make that change happen. It is great for us. I mean, I think it's good that we, the three MDAs that are involved with the HR value chain, the commission, PSO, and METP, we are actually coming together. We have actually come together and we are taking a critical look at what we all need to do because it's not about OTCI driving transformation. As um, Joseph said, this is about us all owning um, the change that needs to happen. And I'm pleased to announce to you that the, the three commissions, the commission, PSO and MATP are actually critically looking at what we need to do again, what we need to put in place to ensure that that happens. As Mrs. Fabamo said, it includes having a look at our performance management system, ensuring that we all have KPIs, ensuring that we all have job descriptions. I'm sure if I was to do a quick survey of the people here, many of us don't have our job descriptions. Many of us don't have our KPIs. So how can we work remotely? How can we manage by objectives um, when all those things are not in place? And how can we even do performance appraisals when the KPIs have not been put in place in the first place? So we need to start calling our accounting officers. Even, you know, let us let us even ask for our KPIs. Let us, you know, con contribute to ensuring that we all have clarity as to what we require to do on a day-to-day, month-in, month-out basis within our own little space. That is why this conversation is happening. That is why we're here today. And we're also looking at creative ways of how we can ensure this um, online learning continues. This is just phase one. The webinar is just phase one. We're actually deploying a full-on learning management system um, that would have all the training programs that every level requires to get them to the next level. And, you know, we, we, we'll have hybrid systems that you can log into and also do the face-to-face -face, um, learning programs um, as well. So really, Lagos um, is, a resilient, is a resilient state. Um, for us, we are the center of excellence. We're not resting on our oars. This isn't a center of excellence competing with other states. We recognize that with the Africa Free Trade um, Agreement coming up, when our borders are thrown open, this is not going to be about us saying that Lagos is, is, is ahead of Oyo, Ogun, the North. This is about Lagos being competitive with the rest of Africa. So we need to do things drastically different to ensure that we actually compete with other states within our continent and not just Lagos state. And, you know, I'm, I'm letting you know that the governor is committed to ensuring this happens. And all of us within the relevant um, HR value chains, we are also committed to doing what we need to do um, to make sure that it happens. Lastly, before I hand over to um, the PS, we, part of this, as I said, we're committed at the top to make it happen, but we also want it to be an organic bottom-up process. And, you know, the governor has approved for us to have an employee engagement survey so that your voice can be heard. And, you know, we actually get your thoughts um, onto the table as to the things that you need to keep within the culture or new things you need to add. I know we all know it already, but we're looking at practical steps. Let's engage, um, let's, let's give feedback so that we can make decisive de uh, decisions based on data as to what we need to do, what we need to put in place um, going forward. And coincidentally, that engagement survey is actually being done by Deloitte. Um, and, you know, the links will be shared. It's very simple questions. Please, please share it when you get it. And please, please um, also engage 
um, and, and, and fill it in. So I'd like to thank everyone. Before PS thanks everyone, I'd also like to thank, thank you all. The fact that you're on this call, um, it really gladdens our heart. We thank, um, uh, I'll start from the external for me. Don't worry, PS, you can still do your own, but I have to do my own little, um, very, very quick one because I know that our time is fast spent. Um, starting with um, Mr. Joseph Olof, inshallah, he's passionate about the future of work. I know that it's because he was, he was restricted. We have to restrain him. That 20 minutes is not enough for him. If we had let him go, he'll be here for two hours sharing um, what we need to do. And maybe this will be another webinar where we'll give you more time to really get us to understand what the future of work entails. But at least thank you for giving us a conversation starter. And for um, Titi Akisoya, Mrs. Titi Akisoya, um, I call her fondly TA. Um, she's my mentor, um, my coach. You know, I mean, I can, I can go on and on. She's um, the former pr uh, president of the International Coach Federation, a trainer extraordinaire, as I'm sure you can tell. We'd like to thank you for moderating so expertly. Um, and summarizing the, the, the topics, it's not easy summarizing on the go. And the way that she was able to actually summarize each person's presentation so succinctly, you know, it just goes to show um, the caliber of moderator that we chose for this. And the last, but certainly not the least, um, our very own chairman of the Civil Service Commission, who, as you all know, is extremely passionate about making sure that she's, she's vested, she's personally vested in ensuring that we, we, we take Lagos State back to the former, not even former glory, because it's, not, it's a future glory. Really, really, really get the state's um, civil service to a point where we will, be the glory, we will be the point of reference from those in Nigeria and also outside Nigeria. And I know, and as I said, she has really uh, done a lot um, and contributed a lot to the ongoing efforts um, to this new wave of, of, of evolution of the state civil service. So thank you um, to everybody behind the scenes as well, DTPS, everyone on my own service delivery team for making this happen. And we will continue. As I said, this is the phase one of our webinar series. It will be continued. So please follow us on all social media platforms, hashtag us and, and share the word because it's important that other people also know about what's going on. Please share the word, send out um, on your social media platforms your thoughts, your, your, your feedback um, on this webinar so that the one that we have next week will also be well subscribed. The one next week is also on resilience, but resilience from the leadership and self perspective. What do you need to do emotionally, mentally, physically um, to be a resilient worker? It's going to be extremely insightful. And I also encourage you to please register and please attend um, that one, which is really about you, is about self. Um, and that's one thing that nobody can take away from you, that capacity development that has to do with building and growing you, um, taking you from your um, comfort zone to that place where you, you optimize your own capacity. So thank you very much again for joining this call. I look forward to seeing you next week, Tuesday, for another session. Um, we're going to continue. It's going to be every Tuesday and Thursday. So please watch out for the topics. Lagos Business School is taking um, a session on Thursday. Um, so please watch out for the sessions. I think they're going to be extremely interactive. Thank you very much for joining this call. So I'll hand over to the PS to, for the former close of um, wrap up close and to thank everybody again. PS, over to you. Thank you very much, the Honorable Commissioner. I wouldn't have wished to have another commissioner because you've really, really taken us through a number of things that are making the wave particularly in this period of adversity. Let me just um, start the closing remarks and vote of thanks by saying we are extremely and deeply grateful to Mr. Governor, who has actually recognized the need for establishments, training and pensions to be alive in period of, in period of adversity like this. Um, one of the things that Mr. Governor had done, which had made it so different, is ensuring that we paid close to 2 billion naira to about 500 pensioners on the 31st of March, 2020, when there was total lockdown of the entire public service. And we did this too electronically. So it's a reflection of the fact that things are changing. 
we must move with the train or else you are left behind. Let me also thank the deputy governor and the entire executive council because we started this resilience series with the executive council and the body of palm sex. We had a diet uh, that was run by Ernst and Young and uh, a number of other facilitators uh, some 48 hours ago. Um, today is not different at all. In fact, today is even a kind of an improvement on what happened some 48 hours ago with um, our sister that I will always call the youngest of the young because she has refused to grow old. Uh, Mrs. Titi Akinsoya, who has moderated this session so perfectly. She's my vice president in um, the Institute of Chartered Personnel Management and Chartered Institute of Personnel Management. And I appreciate the fact that we were able to bring out Mr. Joseph Olofinshola too from uh, his responsibilities in Deloitte to come and share experience and also keep us on our toes in um, being resilient as a workforce. Thank you will just be too inadequate to the Chairman Civil Service Commission, um, a trainer per excellence who had taken us through it and has been able to mix our experience as an insider with the realities, with global realities. Uh, my Honorable Commissioner, don't mind me. I've become too fond of you that I didn't even respect uh, courtesies. I want to specially thank you because you've given me every kind of run to know that I also have to be on the move. And uh, we are seeing results too, and we are happy. So establishment team, um, you are doing well, but we can still do better. Uh, those in training, I want you to read over and over my comments on your platform. This is not the time to be left behind. We must all be up and doing. And finally, but not in the least, I want to specially thank all the over 1,500 that subscribed to this session. Of course, we are not able to take all of you at a go, but we have taken uh, some substantive number now, substantial number, and we intend to take others, hopefully by 5 p.m. later today. Once again, thank you all for being part of this um, movement towards a change that would be sustained and also improved on. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Is admin, can you stay?